Welcome to conference coverage highlights presented by ReachMD on XM160 and powered by Health Day. Conference coverage highlights features the latest clinical information and research findings from the 32nd Annual San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. The meeting took place December 9th through the 13th, 2009. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Kina. And I'm Sue Berg. This year's meeting attracted more than 8,500 scientists and other professionals from 90 countries around the world. There were more than 1,000 presentations on breast cancer and pre-malignant breast disease and its biology, etiology, prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. Highlights included four press conferences, which addressed bisphosphonates as well as drugs in the pipeline, new treatment paradigms, and patient management and prognosis. The bisphosphonates press conference included a new analysis of data from the Women's Health Initiative study of more than 150,000 postmenopausal women in generally good health. At the start of the study, about 2,200 of the women were using bisphosphonates. Investigators found that bisphosphonate use was associated with a 32% reduction in invasive breast cancers. The study's lead author from the Los Angeles Biomedical Research Institute at Harbor UCLA Medical Center said at the press conference that this drug has a well-defined toxicity profile and is in widespread use, and the number of women taking the drug could be extended if this result is confirmed. Further, these results suggest an agent with relatively mild toxicity that can influence receptor-negative breast cancer. Additional study could reveal what the mechanism of this influence might be, but according to researchers, this treatment may now be further considered for women potentially starting bisphosphonate use for low bone mass. The study's lead authors assert that the combination of a bisphosphonate-supporting bone mass coupled with an aromatase inhibitor which reduces contralateral breast cancer could make a huge impact on breast cancer incidence. Another study presented at the bisphosphonates press conference found that the use of bisphosphonates for at least one year was associated with a 29% reduced risk of breast cancer. Israeli researchers used a structured interview to evaluate over 4,500 postmenopausal women using bisphosphonates for at least five years. The researchers report finding that bisphosphonate users who developed breast cancer were more likely than non-users to have estrogen receptor positive tumors and less likely to have poorly differentiated tumors. The self-reported long-term use of bisphosphonates prior to diagnosis was associated with a significant reduction in relative risk for breast cancer by approximately 34%. The relative risk for breast cancer remained significantly reduced at 29% after adjusting for a number of risk factors for breast cancer, including age, fruit and vegetable consumption, physical activity, family history of breast cancer, ethnic group, body mass index, use of calcium supplements and hormone replacement therapy, number of pregnancies, months of breastfeeding, and age at the time of first pregnancy. In addition, the breast tumors identified among patients who used bisphosphonates were more often estrogen receptor positive and less often poorly differentiated compared with patients who did not use bisphosphonates. These tumors are associated with a better prognosis. During a press conference on new treatment paradigms, Dr. Kimberly L. Blackwell of the Duke University Medical Center in Durham, North Carolina, presented a study in which about 300 women with metastatic breast cancer were randomly assigned to receive either 1,500 milligrams a day of lapatinib alone or 1,000 milligrams a day of lapatinib plus 2 milligrams per kilogram of trastuzumab every week. The researchers found that the combination therapy extended survival by more than four months compared to lapatinib alone. They also noted a trend toward a 25% reduced risk of death. Dr. Blackwell said the study broke new ground because it showed improved survival without the use of endocrine therapy or chemotherapy. The study showed the effectiveness of combined targeted therapy. According to Dr. Blackwell, no other study has examined this combination in a Phase three randomized design. In another noteworthy study presented at the meeting, investigators used the 21-gene recurrence assay to analyze about 365 tumor specimens from women with node-positive, estrogen-receptor-positive breast cancer. The women were treated with either tamoxifen alone or tamoxifen plus chemotherapy. In the combination therapy group, investigators found a recurrence score below 18 predicted no benefit from the addition of chemotherapy. However, a high recurrence score of 31 or above predicted significantly improved rates of disease-free survival with the addition of chemotherapy. The authors conclude that a low recurrence score identifies women who might not benefit from anthracycline-based chemotherapy despite positive nodes. The study was published online in the journal Lancet Oncology on December 10th to coincide with the meeting. 
Findings were presented from a recent study suggesting that African-American women with hormone receptor positive HER2 normal breast cancer have significantly lower disease-free and overall survival compared to women of other races. Investigators found that this racial disparity persisted even after controlling for such factors as higher incidence of more advanced stage disease, more aggressive triple negative disease, disparities in medical care, and comorbidities. This study included nearly 5,000 women with axillary lymph node positive or high-risk node negative breast cancer. The study's authors noted in a statement that African-American patients exhibited similar adherence to the chemotherapy and hormonal therapy and did not have worse outcomes if they had other breast cancer subtypes. The findings may indicate that African-American women with hormone receptor positive breast cancer are more prone to have disease recurrence despite state-of-the-art medical care and warrant further investigation. In another study, researchers at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida, and colleagues from the North Central Cancer Treatment Group, a national clinical research group sponsored by the National Cancer Institute, looked at outcomes in women who underwent surgery to treat stage 1 to 3 invasive HER2-positive breast cancer in addition to receiving chemotherapy plus Herceptin versus women who underwent surgery and received chemotherapy alone. Researchers compared outcomes in over 1,000 women who received chemotherapy alone and a similar number of women who received chemotherapy followed by Herceptin. In women who received chemotherapy followed by Herceptin, the researchers found that the five-year disease-free survival rate was 80 percent, compared to 72 percent for those who received chemotherapy alone. They also compared outcomes in about 950 women who received chemotherapy followed by Herceptin and those who received concurrent chemotherapy and Herceptin. In this comparison, investigators found that the five-year disease-free survival rate was 84% in women who received concurrent therapy, compared with 80% in those who received chemotherapy followed by Herceptin. This is the first trial developed to define the optimal way to incorporate Herceptin in the context of adjuvant chemotherapy. The authors concluded that concurrent use is the best way to decrease cancer recurrence. Further, the authors say that 10,000 women worldwide annually may have better outcomes if Herceptin is used along with chemotherapy. This study was partially supported by Genentech. Findings were presented at the meeting on the effect of anti-estrogens on lung cancer mortality in breast cancer patients. Recently, the Women's Health Initiative reported that women on hormone replacement therapy have an elevated risk of dying from lung cancer. In this study, investigators hypothesized that if exposure to estrogens can worsen lung cancer outcomes, then anti-estrogens may improve its prognosis. Over 6,500 patients with breast cancer recorded in the population-based Geneva Cancer Registry between 1980 and 2003 were included in the study. 46% received anti-estrogen therapy. Age, sex, and population data were used to calculate standardized incidence ratios and standardized mortality ratios in order to compare the study population to the general female population of Geneva. During the study period, 40 cases of metachronous lung cancer developed. The mortality rate was 9.23 per 100,000 for women with anti-estrogens and 44.97 per 100,000 women without anti-estrogens. The investigators concluded that women who received antiestrogens as breast cancer treatment have a significantly decreased risk of dying from lung cancer. The result seems to further the support of the role of estrogens in lung cancer prognosis and suggests that exposure to antiestrogens may offer some protection against tumor mortality. According to two studies presented at the meeting, obesity is associated with poorer breast cancer outcomes, and alcohol consumption may increase the risk of breast cancer recurrence by 34%, in those who consume more than three alcoholic drinks per week, compared with those who drink less or do not drink at all. Researchers in Denmark analyzed data on nearly 54,000 breast cancer patients. They found that women who were overweight and obese were more likely than women with a normal body mass index to have advanced breast cancer at the time of diagnosis, respond less favorably to adjuvant treatment, and were at increased risk of developing distant metastases and of dying from breast cancer. A second study designed to assess the role of alcohol in breast cancer survival involved nearly 1,900 women diagnosed with early-stage invasive breast cancer. During the study's eight-year follow-up period, there were 349 cancer recurrences and 332 patients died of the disease. Consumption of three or four drinks per week was associated with a more than three-fold increase risk of recurrence. The largest number of women who consumed alcohol consumed wine, followed by liquor and then beer. Risk was particularly elevated in women who consume more than two glasses of wine per day. The researchers concluded that alcohol consumption may negatively affect the prognosis of women who have been diagnosed for breast cancer. 
The association between alcohol and breast cancer recurrence may suggest that women should limit their alcohol consumption after diagnosis of breast cancer. Findings were presented that suggest that magnetic resonance imaging scans may be helpful for earlier breast cancer diagnoses in high-risk patients. According to investigators in Canada, MRI may also find more cancers at less advanced stages. Researchers divided over 1,200 women with a BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene mutation into two groups. One group was screened with MRI plus mammography. The control group underwent conventional mammography screening. The investigators reported 41 cases of breast cancer diagnosed in the women in the MRI group compared to 76 cases in the mammography-only control group. Women in the MRI group were diagnosed with more early-stage and fewer advanced cancers. The researchers also found that cancers in the MRI group tended to be smaller. The average size of invasive tumors was 0.9 centimeters compared to 1.8 centimeters in the control group. The investigators commented that since screening with MRI detects cancers at a much earlier stage, more utilization of this diagnostic modality will probably save lives. The investigators added that they hope these results will convince high-risk patients as well as healthcare providers that breast screening with yearly MRI and mammography is a reasonable alternative to prophylactic mastectomy. According to a study presented at the meeting and published in The Lancet on December 11th to coincide with the presentation, addition of chemotherapy to standard tamoxifen treatment appears to significantly improve disease-free survival compared to tamoxifen alone in postmenopausal women with hormone receptor positive, node positive breast cancer. Researchers randomly assigned over 1,470 women to receive one of the three treatments, tamoxifen only or chemotherapy followed by tamoxifen or chemotherapy plus concurrent tamoxifen. Patients were followed for a maximum of 13 years. Researchers report that women who received either chemotherapy followed by tamoxifen or chemotherapy plus concurrent tamoxifen were less likely to die from disease-related causes than women who received tamoxifen on its own. Patients given combinations of chemotherapy and tamoxifen had marginally improved survival rates. The study's authors conclude that for postmenopausal women with few comorbidities who have a substantial risk of recurrence or death based on the prognostic profile of their tumor, The risk-benefit balance favors anthracycline-based chemotherapy followed by tamoxifen. However, the authors also say that characteristics of the tumor should be factored into the risk-benefit ratio. Further, they add that this study shows the necessity of long-term follow-up of adjuvant therapies to determine the outcomes of treatment. The study was funded by the National Cancer Institute. Thank you for listening to conference coverage highlights from the 32nd Annual San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, which took place December 9th through the 13th, 2009. Conference coverage highlights is a presentation of ReachMD Radio, broadcast on XM160 and by live stream at ReachMD.com, and powered by Health Day.